so I will start uh, from. Oh, I cannot. Okay, I will start uh, from the phase diagram, which we all know, and just remind you that on the overdub side, uh, the resistivity exhibit uh, in the Fermi liquid regime exhibit T squared to very elevated temperature. And then what is kind of interesting is T squared evolves continuously to something which is like linear like uh, uh, around optimal doping. And then uh, if you go even more under doping, uh, resistivity is linear like, and then it drops faster uh, uh, than linear above a characteristic temperature, which is we call pseudo gap temperature T star. Uh, what we did, we carefully look resistivity, first in mercury one-to-one -one compound, which is a model uh, compound. And we have found uh, by looking at many compounds that in the pseudogap regime, we find a T-square regime. Uh, but before that, I would like to emphasize that we also established that the sheet resistance is universal for all the cooperates. And this is already as amazing uh, experimental fact. And then this resistivity in the pseudogap regime uh, exhibit T square behavior where the coefficient A2 is essentially proportional to P. Uh, P is doping. So one can immediately conclude that uh, in fact the scattering rate is T square and uh, it doesn't change uh, as a function of doping. And in fact, it seems that it expands to very overdope regime uh, that is the same scattering rate and as in overdope regime. Uh, that this is probably so in the pseudogap regime for sure, uh, follows also from the measurement of the hole done in 2004 by Ando, where he established that the hole coefficient is temperature, uh, more or less temperature independent, and indeed correctly in the underdope regime measure the carrier density, uh, and, and then indeed uh, this uh, change of the coefficient A2 corresponds to the change of the carrier density and not to the change in the enhancing of the scattering rate. And finally, to really demonstrate that uh, we are dealing in the thermoliquid uh, with itinerant carriers, which are uh, thermoliquid-like, uh, we showed, we look for the scalings. Uh, we know how scaling we need to look. Uh, we established that the color rule is obeyed. It's the typical thermoliquid scaling. And we also demonstrated uh, optical uh, from the optics spectroscopy that the optical scattering rate exhibit uh, more or less thermoliquid uh, scattering rate. And with these uh, two scalings, uh, I believe, which are really uh, rare scalings, which are demonstrated in, in cooperates, we have, in my opinion, firmly established that, uh, uh, that, that the itinerant carriers in the pseudogap regime uh, behaves as thermoliquid uh, carriers. Then, from this heart of the problem, we address many different regimes. Once when you know something about the pseudogap, it allows you to go from electron dot cooperates. Uh, we look at the logarithmic uptrends, which appears in this part of the phase diagram. Uh, we look at the high field, low temperature phase, uh, which appears here around 10%. Uh, I would like to point out that we have a very recent paper on archive, which uh, consistently explains how from the normal state we can come to this reconstruct pocket-like uh, Fermi phase uh, above 40, 50 Tesla, which emerge at low temperature. Uh, but what is important that all, the, all these different parts of the phase diagram, we can kind of explain on the same footing, which uh, I try to explain you by addressing the strange metal regime, and then I will connect the strange metal regime and not, uh, uh, to the superconducting state. Uh, I also would like to say that we also established that the superconductivity appears around 20, 30, 40 Kelvin above TC, and in fact, that it seems a percolative uh, phenomenon. <coughs> okay, so starting with the strange metal regime, the characteristic is that the resistivity exhibit uh, linear T behavior. And of course, many uh, were triggered by that and uh, associated that with a linear-like uh, uh, scattering rate. But when we're looking at the resistivity, the simple through the formula, we need to take care about it. We have a scattering rate, we have a density of state, and we have uh, uh, effective mass which enters in. And if you look at the evolution of the Fermi surface, what is kind of certain is that the carrier density is changing. Uh, so we address this problem uh, by measuring, again, the whole effect, mercury one to also one sample, 
So this is here. We also measure the resistivity. You see this nice T-square uh, behavior in the pseudo-gravity regime and nice linear-like behavior in the strange metal regime. Uh, this green line tells you where the, the, the doping is, and we see that nicely uh, the whole effect is again in the pseudo gap regime measure nicely the, 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 the carrier density. Uh, and then if you take the these two curves, this one and this one, uh, this one and this one, sorry, uh, and you just divide them uh, one by other, you get the cotangent hole angle, uh, and in the simplest possible uh, case, uh, this should give you M star over tau. And uh, what is really amazing and, and absolutely shocking for me is that uh, this cotangent hole angle is T square, and furthermore, it's doping independent. You don't see any changes, any serious changes of uh, crossing any of these characteristic temperature. Uh, the, the cotangent hole angles uh, remains T square. Uh, we measure that across the pseudogap regime in Mercury 101. We always get the same result. Uh, is this particularity of Mercury 101? In fact, it's not. Here I show you the data for LSEO and thallium on the overdope. Again, they exhibit T square. So it was known from 2004 that there is a T square, and earlier, in fact, by by uh, Ong and Anderson was discussed this T square. Uh, behavior of the cotangent hole angle. What was missed is that the slope of all of this is essentially the same. It's universal slope. And it connects to, so, to, to, to Fermi-Liquid regime, the pseudo gap Fermi-Liquid regime and the overdog, where we know what it means, this cotangent hole angle. Uh, so this tells you essentially that the, uh, the, 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 the scattering rate is Fermi-Liquid-like uh, across the phase diagram of Cooperage. And that effective mass is uh, uh, constant and compound independent, more or less compound independent. Okay, I can summarize uh, this transport measurement in two phase diagrams. First one is very simple, it's based on cotangent hole angle, and it simply tells you that it doesn't change, uh, which would imply that the scattering rate is any time t squared and the same across the phase diagram. Uh, the resistivity phase diagram is a little bit more complex. Why? Because it has the carrier density in it. And as we can see from the whole coefficient, it changes once we cross out the Fermi liquid regimes. Uh, what we certainly know for, for, for the carrier density that on overdose side we have one plus P Fermi liquid holes. Uh, what we also know for certain that parent compound is uh, insulated. So that means that, it's, uh, that we have one, uh, and it's a half filling. So it's one localized core. Uh, we also firmly established that uh, in the pseudogap regime, we have P Fermi liquid holes from the DC resistivity. You remember coefficient A2 goes with P. Uh, optical conductivity shows you P. Hole effect shows you P. So that means that in the pseudogap regime, uh, one uh, hole is still localized. So uh, whichever way you go from the full frame surface to the gap frame surface, what happens, you can go high temperature or low temperature. Uh, you gradually, slowly localize one carrier per CO2 plaquette. <coughs> okay, so the question is why uh, this localization is gradual? Uh, usually, mode localization is the first talk. Uh, however, here we evoke that, uh, that Cooper rates are uh, very disordered. So this is 600 angstroms by 600 angstroms, and on 600 angstroms, you see a considerable disorder and different gap distributions. And this gap distribution, we attribute to the gap distribution of the local scale. And in fact, for me, the most revealing arguments comes from optical conductivity that indeed we should attribute to the localized gap. Uh, these are very old measurements of Ushida. If you look uh, at the parent compound, you see a very clear uh, charge transfer gap. These are polycrystalline sample, I think that measurements are done at 300 Kelvin. Nevertheless, uh, uh, you dope a little and you see something which people call mid-infrared uh, mid feature and they attribute different uh, different things. However, just follow how it looks. I try to indicate with this dashed line the position of the maximum. And you can see that it shifts to the lower and lower energies. And finally, even in 20%, you see here there is still the shoulder and at 34%, you know what it does it brought exactly the spectral weight of the one localized carrier to the coherent peak. Okay, 
So essentially from the optics, we can by finger see how the spectral weight is shifting and growing and merging and becomes from zero, uh, one is added to the coherent. And that's what we try to mimic. It's a very simple uh, model. Uh, so this is this gap distribution. We use the simplest possible Gaussian. And again, uh, we use it as simple as possible to linearly uh, close it uh, with, to linearly decrease it in energy, shift in energy as optic C as a function of the open. Uh, so on purpose, we stay simple. And all these carriers, which with doping, you know, when the distribution cross the zero, the Fermi level are included in Fermi liquid C. And then we can reduce very simple the number of it P, and then from minus infinity to zero is the integral of the distribution. So how many cross the zero? And this is the result. We go from P to one plus P in a gradual way. This is a T equals zero. And then if you want to add the temperature, we just need to excite over a gap. So this is exciting over a gap, but now the integral goes from zero to infinity. And uh, since we don't know M star over tau from the cotangent coal angle, we can calculate the resistivity. We presented uh, the calculated resistivity by a contra plot. Why? Uh, because we can easily then compare it to the very well known data measured in 2004 by uh, Ando. Uh, so this is uh, coming out from the model. This is coming out from the measurement. Here there is this red line. Uh, which is different. Uh, uh, this is just a structural transition, LTTO to HTT, which is of course not included in our model. Otherwise, we have one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, this is the evolution of the whole effect uh, from the model. This is from the measurement, again, one-to-one -one correspondence. This is from Mercury one-to-one. -one. Uh, the red is a model, the blue dots behind are the uh, experimental data points. This is resistivity, this is whole. And we also extracted this as a function of uh, doping at P, uh, T equals zero, as I already showed you, for thallium and visco from the resistivity. And we did that in uh, two years ago. And this is what we got from the resistivity, how the, the carrier concentration evolves. Uh, this is for visco. And these are how all points measured in 2021, published 2021, uh, obtained by high field data on thallium and BISCO. And again, the carrier density extracted from the whole coefficient corresponds exactly to the carrier density extracted from the resistivity. And I think this is uh, very meaningful. Okay, last but not least, the question is, can we now connect these normal state properties to the superconductive state? And the answer is yes. Uh, here, I will just remind you uh, how we can determine uh, the Holmes law, in fact. So, so uh, from where uh, Holmes got this data, he got them from optical conductivity, and it's a very simple thing. Uh, uh, you can roughly estimate it. So this is the curve measure above TC, and this is curve dash curve measure below TC. <coughs> and this hashed, hashed area is in fact the spectral weight, which is shifted to omega zero delta function. And if you want to roughly estimate, this is sigma DC by uh, multiply two delta, two delta, uh, corresponds to the TC, and here we go, we got the Holmes uh, law. And this Holmes law very well works on the underdog side, and as it was pointed out many times, uh, it doesn't work on the overdog side. So as Ivan Bozovic nicely demonstrated, you increase the TC, so the TC, you, you increase the doping, you decrease the TC, so you're going in this direction, but your superfluid density is decreasing. And uh, we wonder, okay, how this can be and can we understand it based on our model? And the main conjecture from this is, okay, nothing happens with the thermoliquid uh, itinerant carriers, but what happens here is that we lost the localized carriers. And the conjecture is no localized carriers, uh, no superconductivity. So it's the localized carrier which produces superconductivity, which glue you just, uh, which provides glue for the superconductivity. So we said, okay, uh, the simplest what we can do is just uh, uh, improve on the Holmes formula by multiply it by number of local SK. And this number of local SK is we can directly extract from the normal state. 
we know that we have one plus p uh, carriers. Uh, we know the number of uh, itinerant carriers. So one minus number of itinerant carriers corresponds to flipping uh, this uh, diagram upside down. And then we go from uh, zero holes here as doping uh, to one localized hole in a very underdoped regime. And just uh, by taking, uh, and, and then we already got this uh, uh, brown line behind uh, the points uh, with a small correction in this region, which comes from the percolative nature of the uh, superconductivity. And then the full curve is uh, including this correction. So the picture uh, for the superconductivity in Cooper, it looks for us as it follows, or at least for me as it follows. In the underdog regime, uh, in every CO2 units, we have one localized hole. And then we start to go. And when the interspace distance between the, uh, between the electrons is more or less the size of the Cooper pair, we start to see uh, the, the, the superconductivity. We dope more and more, the superconductivity stiffens. But then when we start to come around the optimal doping, we start to lose uh, the localized carrier. We start to lose the glue. As we lose the glue, the superconductivity weakens. And finally, final sex in a fermi liquid regime, pure fermi liquid regime, there is no localized hole reservoir. There is no superconductivity. I would like to say that this curve behind the data we obtain directly from the normal state without introduction any additional uh, parameters. We just measure and look, and sigma BC is essentially proportional to N effect. Okay, in summary, uh, what we have demonstrated uh, is that the effective mass and the Fermi velocity and tau are essentially compound doping independent and thus universal. The scattering rate is proportional to square and omega square and uh, is presumably nuclear scattering process. And then the Superconductivity can be understood to two uh, uh, formula, which describe what, how many itinerant and how many localized carriers we have. So in, always at any part of the phase diagram, we have one plus P carriers, when part is itinerant and part is localized, and we can determine from fall effect, resistivity, optics, or whatever. And then the superfluid density is simply proportional to the number of effective and number of localized carriers. I would like to say that this implies a very short range uh, glue, you know, on the level of unit two, three unit cell. And coherence length is also one, two nanometers. So this is also uh, a seemingly good mechanism. And then uh, we know also that's a D wave glue and uh, the localized carrier presumably sits on the D orbital of the copper is also this symmetry. Anyway, to summarize uh, the answer to, to in my opinion, most important question, uh, in the field, uh, what is the nature of the carriers which become superconducting? They are fermi liquid carriers. We, what provides the superconducting uh, glue? These are the localized carriers. And the Janus phase of the localized carrier in Cooper is, is generating the pseudo gap and the high temperature superconductivity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. What is the mechanism of, a locali of uh, holes localization? So that's, that's a very good, I mean, question. Uh, and uh, we believe it's a mod localization. Uh, uh, at, at zero doping, we are in a mod charge transfer insulator. Uh, so uh, the question is what happens with the mod transition in a single man model, for example, when you have a strong disorder, how the uh, Fermi surface evolves. Uh, there is no clear answer to that and how exactly the lock itself. We know the limiting case. We know that goes to no fermi surface to a full fermi surface. Here, uh, we don't have a single band model. We have three band models. There are oxygens, and we know that we start to go on the oxygens on the other hole. So the question is how this mode state survives in a three band model on the strong disorder. But in essence, we see, we think that uh, behind this localization is a large Hubbard U of 10 electron volts. Okay, any other questions right now? <coughs> and this is the highest energy scale of the problem. Thank so, you. So, you know, before looking at the micro Kelvins, right. I think that one should take a look Thank you. And, and see what the largest energy scale of the problem is. Uh, something I'm, I'm not sure I understand. <coughs> I, uh, uh, you're saying that 
localized holes provided load. The way that translate in my head is you have some localized hole, which is like some kind of a charge, which is bound, and then you have an electron comes, hit it, it causes this thing to vibrate, and then the another one coming will feel that, and they could pair like that. Okay, that's the picture. Oh, something like this, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, I, I buy that. But uh, then what I would, then what you're saying is as we go over those, you have fewer and fewer of these localized holes, and you have more and more of the others. When we go, let's say that we have come to the extreme near the end point, then we have really like 1% of localized and 99% of, of the free ones. Uh, for this reason, your um, uh, coupling, <coughs> your pairing interaction is getting weaker, gap is getting smaller, TC is going down. But if that's the case, uh, then um, if you remember what I showed yesterday, this uh, BCS, BC uh, crossover, as the interaction is getting weaker, we are getting more and more to the extreme BCS side. Uh, it becomes like pure BCS, uh, weak coupling. In that case, you would expect that the, at low temperature, the number of electrons in the superfluid will be the same as the number in the normal fluid, not the other way around. Uh, so, so, well, so, so, is the opposite. No, so, 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 yes, I mean, uh, the thing is that, the, the, first of all, I'm sorry I missed your talk yesterday because I was really in bed lying and being half dead. Uh, so, but I know what you're talking about. Uh, the thing is that it's not only, you know, that, that this mechanism is everything in the unicell and it's very short times. So they couple of two holes and, 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 and then it's gone. Uh, and in this sense, it cannot couple the whole fluid on the overdose side. It will really corresponds only to uh, a few to the number of localized holes, and, and that's it. It's not like you know, it, it, like uh, like Leggett would would, would suggest uh, uh, for, for the for for the for 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 the phonon. I think maybe it superconductivity where few of them, then the whole uh, whole state becomes. It's really short range. Uh, and, and short time uh, glue. Yeah. Okay, uh, there is another question online. Can you hear it? Can you see it in, in Evan? Yes, uh, uh, question online. Yes, I chat. think that whatever it is. It's in the chat. Sorry? Second. In the chat. Second in the. How, how local as whole can help superconductivity? Yeah. That's the question. So yeah. that's exactly how, uh, I mean, even um, essentially answered it already. Uh, uh, he said, okay, if you have a localized hole, there is an electron which bang it, it excites it, or whatever this localized hole da does, and then another electron uh, is attracted by this localized hole. This is a very similar BCS, yes, or it's an excitonic mechanism. Here I would also like to mention that uh, this mechanism is probably a little bit more complicated than that, uh, because the, uh, as, as, as already pointed out by Professor Sunko, oxygen degrees plays a role. Uh, so zinc also showed that if you split the leave the degeneracy or x or y uh, uh, oxygens, the superconductivity is gone. Uh, okay. Also, it was no observation, in fact, by my dad, that if you have a LTT, HTT, uh, LTO, uh, uh, LTO, uh, LTT transition, uh, th this degeneracy also splits the oxygen. Uh, and back then, he already suggested that there is a fluctuation of this localized hole which jumps over the oxygens and produce uh, the glue. And I would like to say that for me, the most interesting part about the charge density wave, that is this charge density wave, it was very early, in my opinion, be, one could see that it's not, you know, producing quantum critical points or anything like this, uh, 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 because if you look at the evolution of the whole coefficient, but the most important question there, uh, in my view, is how does very tiny charge density wave destroy the superconductivity? And I would just like to say that it's established that this charge density wave is an oxygen charge density wave. So it splits again the degeneracy of the oxygens. You know? And then this really points to the mechanism that you have a local less charge on the copper, but it fluctuates between these two oxygen and produce this fluctuation. And that this fluctuation is, in fact, the boson fluctuation which uh, then couples to the itinerant uh, carriers and couples them in the 
in the in in the superconductor. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ivan. Do you have any other comments or anybody else? If not, may I ask a question? Excuse me. May what I ask is another question? question? Sorry. Uh, why don't you consider the possibility that localized holes appear due to electron phonon interaction? Uh, I will represent our report on Wednesday about uh, the <coughs> well, uh, very like picture with existence of localized and delocalized carriers in the model with strong electron phonon interaction. I mean, phonon probably surely has a role in localization to my understanding and my knowledge, which may be not so big as yours, uh, is that that UNCLA process, in fact, promotes uh, mode state. So to get the mode state, you need to have a strong UNCLA. And as you can see, we do have a strong UNCLA because all the scattering is dominated by the UNCLA processes. Uh, we say that, uh, you know, you have a 10 electron volts on this position from, from Harvard U. And uh, many people agree that this uh, parent state is the most state where the, 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 the two, two charge carriers look the, themselves due to the Hubbard okay. I don't have any other right. uh, okay. arguments, uh, and I don't mind it's different.